Hi, my name is Ken Rocket. I'm the spokesperson for Casino Free Milford. We're a grassroots organization fighting the proposed casino in Milford, Massachusetts. Uh, we're here tonight to listen to Foxborough's Stephanie Crimmins and Ginny Coppola do a presentation on the experiences that they had fighting the Wink Casino in Foxborough, Massachusetts. Uh, hi, I'm Stephanie Crimmins. I'm from the town of Foxborough. I was involved in No Foxborough Casino, which is a group that was formed um, to fight against uh, the billion dollar casino development proposed by um, Steve Wynn and Bob Kraft about a year ago. Um, and I'm here to speak to the residents of Milford and Holliston and the surrounding towns who are concerned about a casino opening in their community. Getting, we're collecting signatures for the um, to present to the selectmen, the Milford selectmen, on Monday night. Oh. Uh, hi, I'm John Tian. I'm a Milford Town Meeting member um, and also the chairperson of Milford's Renewable Energy Advisory Committee. I've been active in Milford politics for probably about the past six or seven years. Um, I'm firmly opposed to the casino and I uh, really think that it would be the wrong move uh, for the town of Milford to approve a casino. Uh, it would really just poison the town. Uh, we've seen it happen in uh, Ledyard and in uh, Stonington, Connecticut. They've had nothing but problems. Uh, family business is going under because the casino just uh, takes over. Uh, and I certainly don't want to see that happen to Milford. I want Milford to remain uh, the town that it is. If we want to put something in uh, in that location, let's put a, a, a manufacturing plant in up there or an office park or something else that uh, that would actually uh, uh, add uh, good productivity to the town. Uh, casino jobs are terrible jobs, low paying, uh, and all it does is uh, suck the community dry. Uh, and the, uh, what's your solution to um, how are you going to stop it? How am I going to stop it? Well, we're, we're looking right now at uh, uh, town meeting is coming up for election. One third of the town meeting uh, members are coming up for election uh, on April 30th. Uh, we've also, if the casino gets past the Board of Selectmen, then we've also got a town-wide referendum. So we're organizing against that, uh, against the casino for the town-wide referendum if it ever happens. Uh, and as a, a worst case scenario, there's still going to be, uh, have to be a two-thirds vote of town meeting to rezone the land. Uh, so there are opportunities for us to defeat the casino and we're going to exercise every opportunity we can. Good evening, my name is Pooja Mehta. I work for Senator Karen Spilka. Uh, the Senator actually this afternoon spoke to the, ch the Chairman of the Gaming Commission directly who said he want, that him and the Senator agreed that he would come and speak to our area and make a more collaborative effort uh, to work with the Senator, and, Senator Spilka and Representative Dykema to make sure that not only uh, Hopkinton and Holliston, but the other surrounding communities in our area are also incorporated. For instance, Medway and Ashland. And uh, again, they have talked about possibly coming to, definitely coming to uh, April, uh, to the community in April sometime. Thank you. Hi, I'm State Representative Carolyn Dykeman, and we're here at the Holliston Middle School. Um, we have a presentation upcoming from Stephanie Crimmins and uh, about who was intimately involved in efforts down in Foxborough uh, regarding the casino that was proposed there. And I'm here to um, really listen to people. I know this is an issue that's very important to the residents uh, of this district, in particular Holliston and Hopkinton, and I know there are a lot of them here. And really just want to make sure that I fully understand people's concerns uh, and stay engaged in this really important conversation for our region. <laughs> Hi, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Ken Rocket. I am the spokesperson for Casino Free Milford. And I would like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. Tonight what we would like to do is give you, I'll give you a quick introduction as to where Casino Free Milford is at this point in time. Um, then I'd like to introduce the guest speaker tonight from Foxborough, Stephanie Crimmins. After Stephanie's presentation, we'll open it up for Q&A, and then we'll have a closing after the Q&A. Um, Casino Free Milford is a grassroots organization that started about a year ago shortly after the legislation came, the gaming legislation came into place. Um, we became re-energized when the application came through for the Milford Casino. At that time, um, we met about February, early February, as three towns, Milford, Holliston, and Hopkinton. Um, at that time, it was decided that it would probably be a good thing to get Milford 
up and running. So there's been a lot of time and effort and energy spent in getting Milford um, up and running. And in the last six weeks, I'd like to report that Milford has gone from about five volunteers to, they're getting very close to 100. Um, they set up a structured organization with co-chairs Steve Treadle and John Siever. They have, I think it's eight committees, uh, each committee being populated with I think seven or eight people. I know some of the committees have already met two or three times. Um, they are energized, they are moving forward very quickly. Um, and with that in mind, we're kind of handing over the reins of Casino Free Milford to the Milford group. Um, the, the group that formerly existed as Casino Free Milford is going to support the Milford group. We're also going to strategize as to how best to move forward. Uh, next Monday, Casino Free Milford will be, we've been invited to present our case, our anti-casino case, to the Board of Selectmen in Milford. The Board of Selectmen in Milford consists of three people. One of them is adamantly opposed. The other two are not necessarily pro-casino, they just have not stated how they feel yet. Our goal on Monday is to put enough pain in the presentation to get them to really think hard about this casino. It's a presentation that's very focused on the town of Milford. I, I think it's a little bit different in terms of a lot of anti-casino presentations. It's going to speak to Milford. Um, the, the facts and figures are all related to Milford. Um, everyone who's seen the presentation thinks it's a good one. Now everyone in this room is invited to that presentation. Um, if you go to the presentation, we've decided to wear red as a show of solidarity. Um, the meeting starts at 7, we're slated to go on at 7.20. Where is it? Oh, I'm sorry, it's at Milford Town Hall on March, Monday, March 18th. Now, if you can't make it to the presentation, um, what, I, what I encourage everyone to do here is if you're not on the Casino Free Milford mailing list, Please go to the Casino Free Milford website, sign up on the volunteer page. If you want to, it's the easiest volunteer job in America. You can be an armchair volunteer and just sign up for the mailing list. Very easy. There are a lot of people who are on the volunteer list as a mailing list that they, they, they want to receive updates. So I strongly encourage you, Casino Free Milford, um, to go there and sign up as a volunteer. Not only so I can get the presentation out to you, which I think you'll find highly entertaining, but we can stay in constant contact with you. Can you give the URL here? It's casinofreemilford.com. So I'll hand it over to Stephanie right now. <laughs> all right, that's it. Can you guys hear me? Yes. I'm all, I'm all hooked up. I've got three different microphones and this little wand. And I don't have a pocket. All right. Well, let me start by saying, uh, first of all, thank you, Ken, for the for the lovely introduction. Um, I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, as, as Ken said, over the past uh, few months, I've gotten um, several phone calls from from different people in the area, from Ken and, and others who, who are in this room, and basically they said, "Look, Stephanie, we've got this really, really tough situation that we're dealing with in, in Milford." Um, you know, first of all. Um, the, the proposed casinos on this piece of land that's not necessarily in Milford, it's on the outskirts of town, and it's really impacting other towns more than it's impacting Milford. And I said, oh, that's interesting. We know how you feel. This is a picture of Mike McCarthy. He, um, he joined the Foxborough Casino, but he is a Walpole resident, and he's standing on his property in Walpole that directly abutted um, the, the place of the proposed casino in, in Foxborough. So this really, in Foxborough, impacted the Walpole people, frankly, more than impacted Foxborough. Um, and then they, you know, the, the people would say, um, and, um, and, uh, I forget what they said. Oh, yeah. Okay, so then they would say, and you know, and, and these guys are working with Foxwoods, and, and Foxwoods is obviously a incredibly successful casino. They built you know, the largest casino in the Western Hemisphere. And, and I would say, yeah, exactly. Oh, we know how you feel. 
Uh, we were dealing with Wynn, who is probably the most successful casino operator in the whole entire world. And then they say, and you know, and this guy David Dunes, you know, he is, um, he's known in this area, he's from this area, he has a lot of, of great political connections, um, you know, he's, he, he does, he's built a lot of buildings, and I say, yeah, we, we, we know how you feel in Foxborough, this is the YMCA, uh, the, it's called the, the Kraft Family Center, um, the Kraft has invested millions of dollars, not only in the Y, but in all sorts of charities and things across the, the town of Foxborough, so we truly know how you feel. And then last but not least, they'd say, and, and this guy, Nunes, you know, he's a, he's a successful businessman. He's got millions and millions of dollars. He's done quite well. He's well respected. And we'd say, yeah, we know exactly how you feel. We felt the same way with Mr. Kraft. So but as I can put those things up here, I'm talking to you today. I thought there might be two things that, um, that you guys have going for you here that we didn't have going for us in, in Foxborough. The first of which is, I don't know David Nunes at all, except kind of the really high level stuff that I've, I've read about him. But um, I think I can go out on the limb and say I'm pretty sure he doesn't have four Super Bowl rings. And more importantly, he doesn't have Tom Brady on his payroll. So <laughs> you guys got back up for you. Mostly I just really like this picture of Tom Brady. But, you know, <laughs> okay, so um, as Ken said, I was going to talk about the you know, business of casinos. Um, I worked, you know, my first job uh, out, of, out of college was actually as an analyst at Fidelity Investments. I analyzed junk bonds, highly leveraged companies, and, um, and I followed a number of casino credits. So during that time, I got intimately familiar with the business of casinos. I literally did that for a living. Um, and then actually, what happened in the, in the mid-90s, Foxport decided to look at the prospect of allowing casino gambling in town. And uh, my mother was a town clerk in, in Foxborough for many years, and she said, Stephanie, they're starting to look at this and forming a committee. Will you, will you participate? And, uh, and I was like, oh, OK. Well, I, at the time, I knew a lot about the business of casinos. Um, and, but, but to be perfectly frank, I didn't really have a strong opinion about what it would mean for a town. And so I was like, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll join this committee and, and help out. And so, in the mid-90s, um, I was on this committee and we spent a fair amount of time you know, looking at what happens to towns when casinos um, open up with them. Um, and then actually, fast forward, uh, in, in 2000, I graduated from business school and, um, and a couple of my classmates actually went to work at a couple of the casino companies in, in Vegas. And, um, and it was interesting hearing from them, you know, their kind of perspective on working at one of these places. They, they were going in at, you know, the senior level managers. So, um, so I also kind of got, got to know a little bit more about how these casino companies operate then. And then finally, fast forward another decade, and, you know, we're sitting at home one, one Friday morning, and we literally, you know, looked at Boston.com and saw the news about, um, about uh, Wynn and, and Kraft, you know, proposing the billion dollar casino. So that's, that's how I kind of got involved. And, uh, and it was my background, frankly, working at Fidelity and, um, and doing the research when I was on the committee in Foxborough that really led me to say, this is not good for, for our town. So that's a little bit of my background. But I'll talk about the business of casinos. What does history tell us? You, know, you don't have to look that far to know what happens to small towns when a casino opens. Uh, our friends down in Connecticut, uh, in the towns of, of Ledyard, and Preston, and Montville, and Uncatsville, um, they've, they've lived there now for 20 years. So we have some fabulous case studies to go to, to look at evidence, real hard evidence, of how the, the towns are impacted. And then finally, I'll talk about some advice that, that we have. Okay, you guys are an intimidating bunch. I'm getting <laughs> nervous and thirsty. Okay, so let's see. Uh, the business of casinos. This is a, a famous quote. Steve Wynn, if you want to make money in a casino, own one. I encourage everyone here to think about that, okay? Remember, uh, just go open up a casino. Uh, so first of all, what you need to know, though, about, about these companies is that they are incredibly sophisticated, highly advanced business operations. These are, these are guys that are, um, well, first of all, they recruit from the top business schools, the top uh, law schools, they hire the best and the brightest. They're run by PhDs in psychology, database management. Um, there are billions of dollars at stake. They make billions of dollars. They spend billions of dollars. And this is a serious, serious business. Okay. Um, the other thing you need to know is virtually all of them are highly leveraged or, or junk bond companies. 
And as such, um, this means that they have a, a tremendous amount of debt on the balance sheets. Uh, when, the last time I checked, um, you know, they had like $3.5 billion on, on Win Resorts balance sheets. Um, our friends down in Foxwoods, you know, they're in the two and a half or so billion dollar range. Um, and, and it's like a family who has a, a lot of debt or a really, really high mortgage. If anything goes wrong, um, if the economy downturns or business slows down for, for any reason, um, it really can be, you know, uh, it, it has um, exponential ramifications, if you will. So um, keep that in mind. Okay, so one of the things that we kept hearing in Foxborough, and it sounds like you guys are going to be hearing this in this area too, is that, you know, look, they would say, um, we're going to build hotel rooms, and we're going to build um, a bunch of new restaurants, and for us it was a new convention center, and an ice skating rink, and all these things are going to be part of this complex. And, and the casino is only going to be a really small percentage of, of the square footage. And in fact, they said, you won't even know that there's a casino there. It's going to be in the back of the facility, and you literally you won't see it. And so, you know, so I think a lot of people were, that, that kind of got a lot of people, right? Because who doesn't want a bunch of new restaurants and all the tax revenue that's generated from convention centers and, and whatnot? Um, but, but what you need to know is that, and this is really elementary, so um, I, I, I hope I'm not offending anyone by going, going kind of to this kind of basic level. But what you need to know is that the majority of the revenue of these businesses is, is the casino uh, revenue. And with Wynn, it was 75% of the revenue across their gaming facilities was driven by, by the casino, 25% from these other businesses. Um, and the casino is really where they make their money, okay? It's, it's a highly profitable, uh, high margin part of their business. Um, and, and essentially, they operate as self-contained entities. So basically, their whole goal is to get people in the door and get them to stay for as long as possible and there's absolutely no money left in, in their pocket. And, um, and they do that by offering free drinks, kind of these, you know, the discounted food, the cheap buffets, um, and the free hotel room certainly. But they also do this by um, keeping the rooms cold. They don't have windows. They don't have clocks. Um, they pump oxygen through the halls to keep people awake at night and for, for long periods of time so they're awake and alert and spending money. And they have these incredibly sophisticated loyalty programs where essentially they track every cent that you're spending and as soon as um, frequency of visits or frequency of play starts to deteriorate, they, they send coupons in the mail to encourage people to go again. It's all about creating addictive behavior at these, at these casinos. And the slot machines are really the driver, okay? That's where the bulk of the money is made. And what they can do at, with the slot machines is they can tweak the percentage of the win. So the, the machines, this is a, a, a good tip for you guys, and actually you're not the house with the meeting inside. Um, the machines that are close to the doors or in high traffic areas, those are the ones that generate the, the more wins um, and, and more excitement. So um, but they can really, that's how they control the profitability of these businesses, all through controlling the, the win-loss ratio of the, the slot machines. And as I said before, you know, the slot machines are really, there's all sorts of 60 minute things and all sorts of stuff online about the addictive nature of the slot machines. And essentially, that's, that's what they, they do. They encourage people to just keep pulling that slot you know, over and over again, and they'll reward them with intermittent wins, enough to keep them to, to continue playing. But it's all about essentially you know, getting them to play so they have no money left in their pocket. Um, and the other thing that, that uh, uh, that you need to know in the, the 10Ks and the annual reports, the financial reports um, that all these companies pull, all these companies put out. You know, essentially they call the employees FTEs, and the FTE stands for full-time equivalent. And it's because they have so many part-time people that they have to find a way to, um, to to keep the consistency across the casino you know, operators. So these are high-paying, high turn, I mean low-paying, I'm sorry, high turnover um, positions. And what we found when we looked at, down in Connecticut, there have been some studies that have been done that 84% of the folks who work at the casinos in Connecticut make $22,000 a year. So these are, these are positions that are essentially poverty line positions. They're, they're service sector jobs. Um, and, and for us, you know, certainly in Foxboro, what, what we've seen is that it's, it's, it's hard at times to keep you know, the, the restaurant positions and the waitstaff positions and the housekeeping positions um, staffed. But that's what the bulk of the jobs are at these casinos. So, um, so, so you need to kind of keep that in mind. Okay. So, so now, you know, what, what does history tell us? So one of the things that, um, that the advisory committee in the town of Foxborough did 
right after Kraft and Wind broke the news last year, was they tracked down one of the former mayors of, of the town of Ledyard. And Ledyard is, is where Foxwoods is located. And this woman, her name is Susan Mendelson, she had been the, the mayor of town throughout kind of the, the initial history, uh, or the initial kind of the building, and then the subsequent, I don't know, it was five or six or seven years, but it was a while. And, uh, and she, was, she was a really excellent speaker. But basically what she said was, you know, look guys, what you need to know, what you need to think about is what follows the money, you know? And you have to think that these are big businesses that generate a ton of money, and what happens in places where there's a lot of money being, you know, tossed around, if you will. She said, it's drugs, it's guns, it's crime, it's pawn shops. And she, she said, basically in Ledyard, we were a sleepy little town, and all of those things became problematic for us Overnight, you know, we, we had, of course, we had a little bit of drug problems and stuff, but but it was the schools became, you know, the, the huge. These, we had these huge issues with drugs in our schools. We had a lot more crime. We had we had issues. We had no idea what we were getting into in some ways when the casino opened. So um, so I, I always when I think about um, you know, a casino opening in a small town, I always think back to her stage. Know what what follows the money, and then I had a friend that went down to the Mohegan Sun, and this I thought was fascinating. So this is this is the Mohegan Sun house rules. So this is like when you go to a restaurant and you see you know shirts and, and shoes required type of thing. But they have 14 rules, and it doesn't include shirts and, and shoes are required, and so you need a valid ID and everything. But the number one rule of Mohegan Sun is. No person shall possess any firearm or weapon of any type of facility. So I, I get a kick out of that because, you know, when this woman was talking, we were like, no, oh, maybe she's exaggerating a little bit. You know, guns are really problematic. And then to see, you know, the number one rule of the Mohegan um, Sun is, is this. It was kind of telling. Anyway. Um, all right. So, but, but, but what we really did in Foxborough, you know, is we went around and, uh, and tried to educate our friends and neighbors about what would happen in, in the town was um, these were the things that we really focused on, okay? So first of all, is traffic. Um, so, so traffic, you know, initially when we thought about traffic, we came here and traffic come up over and over again when we talked to folks down in Connecticut. You know, we had visions of you know, Route 1 becoming backed up, 495 becoming backed up. Uh, but as we talk to people down there, it actually it works a little bit differently than that. Those roads certainly get backed up, but, but really what they found um, down there was that the, the back roads leading to the casinos, kind of all the side, the cut groups, if you will, those were the roads that were really impacted. And they, they saw, I mean, three, four, five times, you know, the traffic on those roads after the casinos were open than, than before. And, and one woman said, hey, look, Foxwoods employees, they have a, a separate parking lot. They're bused into the casino. So they take, they avoid the, you know, the main roads as much as possible. They take all these back roads. Um, and, and it's not just, you know, at 9 o'clock in the morning or 8 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock at night. It's 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And it is 18 wheelers who are delivering goods to the casino. It is trash trucks. Um, it's police going back and forth. It is just, just constant noise. And so, you know, that's one of the things that seem to resonate certainly with the with the folks in Foxborough as we talk about this. Of course, when you have all this additional traffic, you have accidents. <coughs> and um, and uh, in this video that Ken mentioned, um, we uh, we interviewed this woman down in Connecticut who owned the bed and breakfast. She was this lovely woman, but she had this beautiful stone wall out in front of her yard. And she said, you know, look. Since the casino opened, my stone wall has been hit 40 times. And basically, what it is, is, is people go to the casino, they spend 20, 30 hours at the casino, they stay awake because the oxygen, the extra oxygen that's in the room, they leave the casino, they get in their cars, they drive, and they fall asleep at the wheel. And so I've been dealing with you know, this recurrent problem of my stone wall being hit over and over again. Um, and, and then certainly, you guys all know that you know, they give away free alcohol um, all day and all night. And so that, of course, leads to um, drunk driving accidents and drunk driving incidents. So um, yeah, big, a big, big problem down there. Um, of course, with all of, of the traffic and crime, et cetera, police and fire, the needs on the, 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 um, the demand from the police and fire departments become pretty significant. Um, with trash and water, you know, this, this former mayor, Ledyard, she basically said, look, we spent a decade dealing with trash down in Ledger because if all of a sudden there, you know, this, this facility was generating acres of trash every day, we had to find a way 
to get that trash out of town, you know, it became this huge issue that we, as a small little town, never even thought that we'd have to deal with. So, um, you know, something, something to, to keep in mind. Um, one of the things that, that we thought was also striking down in Connecticut is that, you know, as I mentioned before, it's all about creating addictive behavior um, with, the, with the slot machines in particular. And what they found in Connecticut was that before the casinos opened, they had one um, addiction treatment center in the whole entire state, okay? After the casinos opened, they had 17. They have 17 treatment centers because essentially, it's all related to the proximity. If there is a, a gambling facility that's in your backyard, that's 10 miles away, you know, people are just more apt to go. And what they found, frankly, was that a lot of the folks um, who end up um, becoming addicted are, are a lot of middle-aged women, frankly, who you know, aren't comfortable going to bars, um, go to the casino because it's, it's safe and it's entertaining, um, and they just become, very, they become addicted to the whole of the slot machine. So um, we, thought, we thought that was interesting and something that we were, you know, scared of because you're bound to know someone. You're bound to know a family whose life will be ruined, basically, by somebody, you know, losing everything at, at, the, at, the, at these casinos. Okay. Um, the school system. So, let's say when, 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 and Kraft were talking about, you know, this, this billion dollar casino, they basically said they need, they thought there would be 10,000 new jobs created. Now, the economy, obviously, still, and it wasn't back then, in a very good position. We all love the idea of new jobs. Um, it's hard to argue against uh, you know, jobs in a market. But as we started to think about it a little bit, it was like, OK. Um, we looked at the town of Foxborough. The town of Foxborough last year at this time had about 600 people that were unemployed. And then we looked at all the surrounding communities. We looked at Mansfield and Sharon and Attleboro and all these towns and cities, and basically, if we added up all the people who were unemployed, it wouldn't be <coughs> close, it would still be a fraction of the 10,000 people that they were saying they, that, that, you know, in terms of the jobs that would be created. And so, you know, we were thinking about this, and then as we went down and talked to the folks in Connecticut, and when I spoke to some of my, some of my former classmates, you know, what they said was, oh, well, of course, they do this, they do international recruiting. So basically, um, what these casino companies do in an effort to find people who are willing to work at a low wage and, and fairly, under fairly tough conditions is they go to China, they go to Russia, they go to Thailand, um, they go to India, they go to places like that and, and, and bring people over for two, three, four years to work at the casino. And, and, and the, the issue and what's happened down in Connecticut um, really is that the school system become burdened uh, because instead of having you know a handful of kids who have English as a second language need, all of a sudden you have a lot bigger population with with diverse language needs that have to contend with. So in Norwich, for example, they went from having a handful to 31 different languages they have to deal with in the school system. So it's Cantonese, it's Mandarin, it's Russian. I mean, it's all these dialects of of, of foreign places. And frankly, it's really hard to find teachers who, who, who can you know, teach the kids and, and work with the kids. So the school systems really do suffer in these towns, and that's certainly what they found down in Connecticut. Um, in, in, in the neighborhoods, you know, one of the things that, we, that we've heard repeatedly that was frankly this term that was completely new to us was that there's this process called um, hot pumping that's take, that takes place. Um, and they've seen it in a bunch of the neighborhoods, uh, certainly in, in, in and around. Uh, the Mahagan Sun and Foxwoods. And basically, because these positions are low paying, they're high turnover, um, you know, they're, they're working a, a lot of hours. People, though, can't afford to rent an apartment, um, certainly can't afford to buy a house. And so, what they do, and what's happened down there, is that the people who had houses with three, four, five bedrooms would move out of town and, um, and, and sell their house to a, a person who basically divided up the rooms into a bunch of apartments or beds, really. And so they basically would, would rent out the bed for, for 12 hours at a time. So there would be this kind of stream of people in and out of the house over the course of the day as their shifts ended, uh, where they would you know, go, go and, and, and have their, their bed. You know, the, so that's called hut bumping. And that is a practice that is prevalent down in the Ledger, Preston, Montville areas down in, in Connecticut. And so you know, as we in Foxborough kind of thought about all these different things and thought about what it would mean for us. I, 
where, where it really hit home was just the whole health values. You know, if you're dealing with all these issues, what happens to the value of your house? And so one of the things that we talked to um, the folks in Connecticut about was, you know, well, what did you see in terms of the house values? And um, one of the selectmen, the current selectmen, um, down in Preston said, well, in the studies that we've done, what we found is that the roads leading to the casino and bordering those, those roads is that, um, is that house values have declined by 20%. And that property value, and people, people have invested their life savings essentially in their homes, and they are, they're wiped out. Um, so for us in Foxboro, this was, this was a big concern. We were terrified of what would happen to our house values um, if, if the, the casino opened. Okay, other issues to consider. Um, casinos never get smaller. Uh, you know, look, you only need to look at what happened, at what's happened down in Foxwoods. That has been a facility that has grown and grown and grown. Um, the most recent casino that's opened up in our area is, is up in Maine, in this town called Oxford, Maine. It opened up about seven months ago. We're already planning another expansion um, because there's just been so much success. So if this casino gets passed in Milford, you know, the, you need to, to know that whatever they pass now is not what's going to be there 10 or 20 years from now. It will be bigger. Um, this is another big issue. And for us, the selectmen, um, it was really, really troubling to the selectmen. You know, liquor licenses now, the way they work is if a restaurant or a bar violates a liquor license, if they serve um, underage kids, if there's you know, a drunk driving accident that happens um, when somebody leaves their facility or someone gets arrested for drunk driving, you know, the, the town now can control what happens. They can punish the restaurant. They can fine them. They can take away their liquor licenses, et cetera. Um, with with the, the gambling, uh, the gambling, the casinos, basically those licenses are controlled by the state. And you know, these liquor licenses are 24 hours a day. They, they're serving alcohol 24 hours a day. And one of the things that we heard, actually, from the folks down in Connecticut was that the drunk driving incidents, um, the arrests, are all hours of the day and night. It's not just, you know, it's not just at night, kind of the typical times when people are, are drunk driving, but it's when the kids ride their bikes around, around their neighborhoods. I mean, it is all hours of the day and night. And then, and then finally, um, what happens to, you know, whatever is negotiated, the mitigation package, if there's financial distress, if there's a bankruptcy, if the entity is sold. And, um, and look, you know, there has been, obviously, Massachusetts passed this gambling law. New Hampshire is looking to do something. Rhode Island's looking to do something. You know, everybody's cannibalizing everyone over a kind of a fixed base of, of casino players, a fixed amount of money. And so there is, you know, the, the prospect of unlimited revenue and profit from these gambling casino places is really starting to come to a close. And I know you guys have, have certainly seen down in, in, in Foxwoods, you know, they, they're, this was from the New York Times last year, Foxwoods is fighting for its life. You know, they're, they're, in, they're in some financial trouble. And so from, from our standpoint, though, you know, from Foxwoods' standpoint, it's like, okay, you know, right now, let's say we negotiate this great mitigation package where the town gets a lot of money and, um, and we, we feel good about it. If, for whatever reason, if, if the, the casino doesn't do well, um, you know, if they file for bankruptcy, that mitigation package is wiped away. And you, you're starting over and you're starting with nothing. Um, and, and if it's sold, you know, right, you know, if, if we felt, some people felt good because Bob Kraft was involved, so there's obviously a level of comfort, familiarity, people like him, respect him. But, you know, there was no saying that, that, that the Kraft family would be involved in the casino for decades. I mean, they could, they could sell to folks in China for crying out loud. I mean, there's a lot of casino players who are in Macaw and other, other parts of the world, Malaysian. And so, um, so this is something that, you know, as we thought kind of longer term, more strategically about what might happen and how much um, comfort we could have around what was negotiated, um, this was something that, that we really were concerned about. And the other thing certainly is that one of the things that we found is that casino oper operators consistently um, underperform what they say that they're going to do. They, you know, they, they make lots of promises that, that don't necessarily come to fruition. So, um, so you guys should, should take a look at this article. It was really, really well done. So in, in Foxborough last year, I know you guys are in a slightly different position given that there are multiple towns involved. But for us, it became all about getting to our board of selectmen. We have a five-member board of selectmen. And um, we had two people who were, who were opposed to it, um, two people who seemed to be for it, one person who was really on the fence. 
and uh, the guy I hear Mark Sullivan was the, uh, the, the swing vote, if you will. He, he is uh, insistent that he's going to write a book about the fact that he was the swing vote today. But um, yeah, so he, uh, so it was all about though getting to the selectmen and reinforcing, you know, how we how we felt about this prospect of the casino. And uh, we had elections in May. And, um, and for us, it was all about getting rid of one of the pro-casino people who was up for re-election and really making sure that we had some, some anti-casino folks. Um, Lorraine Brew was running for re-election. She was, she was very much opposed. And Jenny, uh, Jenny Coppola, who is, who is here today also, um, was against the casino. And we, our, our effort, all of our focus, essentially was around getting those two, Jen, uh, Lorraine to be re-elected and Jenny into office. That was, that was our focus from from the middle of February on. So um, I'll tell you that resources are, I mean, there's so much information out there, and, and you don't have to look too far. You know, one of the most striking and I thought compelling letters to the editor that was, that was written last year was written by um, somebody who had lived in Foxborough for years, and she said, look, you know, this, this came about, this whole wing craft thing, and I didn't know what to think, so I just Googled it. I Googled, Googled casino gambling, and I went online to see, you know, all right, well, well, what are they saying? And she said they were like 500,000, you know, kind of things that popped up. And it was, you know, addiction, treatment centers, crime, rape, pawn shops. You know, it was like one negative thing after another negative thing. And, um, and so, so the issue really is you don't have to look that far. There's, you know, it, it is, um, these are called mitigation packages with the casino developers for a reason. It's to mitigate the problems that they know are going to come up. So um, the facts are on your side. Tons of resources are available. And, um, and, and it's all about, it was for us, it was all about educating certainly our selectmen and, um, and the general population so that they understood what some of the issues and fears that, that we felt they should have are. Um, Stock credit for gambling has, has a, a bunch of, of great videos um, and um, facts and research that's on there. Um, our site, the No Foxborough Casino site, is a really good one. We have a bunch of studies that are in kind of the, the study page in the, in the middle where you can go and click on you know, different things that we found when we did our research. Um, as Ken mentioned, you know, we have a 28-minute video. Um, this video was put together by folks, folks on, on, um, on the you know, Foxborough Casino team. It's really, really, um, really good. Um, Casino Free Philadelphia is another site. There was, there was one that was um, uh, created for the folks in Vancouver and Miami. So basically all these different people from around the country have come to the site. There's tons of uh, research and information available. Um, there's also, in Massachusetts, um, there's a repeal the deal um, and, and, uh, initiative that's beginning to take place, that a group that's beginning to form, essentially to argue that, um, that you know, this, this legislation that was passed a year and a half ago, two years ago, is not good for the state of Massachusetts. As you know, we as citizens never voted on it. Um, this was done by our, our, our state reps and, and whatnot, um, but they're trying to repeal this deal. And they've got some really talented people who are involved in that. So um, I would encourage you, if this the prospect of gambling in general in the state of Massachusetts is an issue to you, definitely look into that. Um, and then, and then in terms of specific advice. Okay, so so in, in Foxborough, you know, basically what happened was when the news broke, um, I got involved, my sister was involved, and then there were a few other people who kind of we all found each other on, on Facebook, frankly. Um, and we were all very concerned about this casino. And then over the, the next couple of, of weeks, um, a number of other people started to, to, to join the fray and, and ask how they could get involved. And basically what, what we ended up doing in Foxborough was, was we essentially formed a management team. Um, it wasn't formal or anything, but you know, we had a group of probably eight people who were the senior team. Um, and, and each of us kind of had a, a different role. Um, we had an IT person who built our website and could update the website on a regular basis. Um, we had a, a, a constant <coughs> contact database person who, um, you know, could, could manage the email database that, that um, we created. We had um, a community outreach person who organized open houses and these kind of uh, places where we helped educate people. Um, we had a PR person who literally was dealing with, you know, the Globe and the Foxborough Reporter and all the local um, press um, on, a, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, 
let's see, we had a, a person who was an attorney who had experience um, in state politics. Um, we had my dad, who's in the, 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 um, the audience here today, who's kind of a general, all-around, research, go-to person whenever you needed anything done, dropping off signs, etc. Um, we had a woman who was kind of a research expert, and, and we really formed kind of this the senior team. And, um, and, and we had hundreds of volunteers and people who were against, um, against the casino um, who all helped us, but, but we were the team who was kind of making decisions around the strategy, around what we felt it was important to focus our time on, around what messages we felt were the most compelling and important to, to get across. And so you know, my advice to you is, um, you know, Ken I know is kind of leading the charge, but it's important to get some people who have real skills and expertise in different areas to help out. And there are people that are definitely out in your community um, who, you know, you have to recruit. I mean, I'm like, I'm the ask person now. It's, if there are any issues, I call up people, I say, can you do this? We need, we need you to do X, Y, Z. And you know, they'll get turned down and whatnot. But the, there are people that are out there that can really be beneficial. And you have to form kind of a, a team of, of folks who you can rely on. Um, educate your friends and neighbors. I mean, this was, you know, this was really, really key. It was all about, you know, every people, people like you talking to the neighbor at the coffee shop, you know, um, <clears throat> talking to the friends on the soccer team and basically saying, you know, this is, wait a minute guys, you need to think about this. You need to do a little bit of research on the internet. You know, you need to, you need to go to some of the sites that are out there. You need to think about what this will mean for the town long term, especially if you've got a house, if you've got kids in the school system. You need to, you need to tell, you need to be the um, apostles, essentially, of, of what, this, what this can do to your town. You really do. And, you know, and it's uncomfortable. You know, it's uncomfortable to be the person talking about this. It's uncomfortable being the person standing up and, and complaining about it. It really is. I get it. You get a lot of criticism. I've, I've certainly had my fair share. But you know what? This is this type of development does not belong in a town like Milford, or and, you know, it doesn't belong in any small town. It certainly doesn't belong in Foxborough. And people need to take a stand. You guys need to take a stand. You need to get involved. You need to fight against this because these are massive, massive um, developers operators with billions of dollars at stake. And if you don't take a stand, they're going to roll you over. You can rest assured they will roll you over. People are passionate about this. People are passionate against it, passionately against it. And frankly, there were, at least in Foxborough, passionate, people who were passionately in favor of it. And you know, and, and what we as kind of our, our No Fox for Casino group always said was there'd be some folks who are gonna be for this for whatever reason, um, but, but the fact is most people don't know enough or haven't really thought about it enough. And if you can take the time to engage them, to educate them, most times you can convince rational people that, that something like this does not belong in the town. Um, and finally, you know, look, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that I said to Ken repeatedly was, you know, who are the selectmen? If I were you guys, I would be calling those selectmen. I would be sending them reports. I would be. I, I took, you know, I took Mark Sullivan out to breakfast. He and his wife, you know, I, I sat down and showed them the, the annual reports <coughs> from from Wind Resorts, and I said, "You need to look at this. You need to understand what is going on here." So, you know, if you guys ha haven't started a campaign where you're can, trying to get in touch with the, sele the selectmen, especially in Milford, and convince them that this doesn't make sense, you got to do it now. You really need to do it now because they are the ones. They can say no. They can choose not to negotiate. They can they can choose to say no. And you need to get on that. Uh, I would say you need to get on that fast. And they need to hear from a diverse set of, 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 of people as well. You know, it can't just be the same five or six people calling them up and, and talking to them. The more people they hear from different parts of town, from different demographic, you know, areas and, and ages and whatnot, the better off you as, as a town and as a community will, will be. And then finally, um, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Look, you know, in Foxborough, we hardly changed the world. We, we did something that, um, that, you know, at the end of the day, we stopped the development from happening, which should never have been proposed in the first place. Um, but it took a lot of work, it took a lot of courage, it took a lot of people standing up and getting involved. And, um, and, and that's what you need to do here. This is very doable. Don't, don't get me wrong. It is very, very doable, but you, you need to take a stand.